Chapter 9 The Nether Griffin As each of the children crawled through the opening of the cave on their hands and knees, Jeremy kept count to make sure that everyone was there. When they were all finally inside and standing again, he spread out the torches at different positions in the long, single-file line. The inside of the cave was damp. Jeremy took the lead, followed by Plucky, Domaris, then Minikin, and so on. The floor of the cave was just as Judd had found it, uneven with scattered stones. At times, one side would be higher than the other. Other times, cracks in the rock would form small ledges easy to trip over. Sometimes it was a narrow path. Once in a while they found it extremely wide. The tunnel stretched along with only slight curves and turns. Occasionally, there were recesses in the wall of the cave. The torches showed many of these to be only shallow rooms or alcoves, but some could have been off-branches into other parts of the mountain. It hadn't occurred to Jeremy that the cave was anything but a straight shot through to the other side. Ever since Plucky had entered the cave this time, he had felt a bit strange. He didn't realize what it was. He didn't know that it was the soft light that he missed. He felt insecure, almost lonely, as if someone's presence was missing. He did not recognize the loss as anything more than a feeling, though, because he had no conscious memory of the light. It also seemed to him that the path had not been this straight, but he didn't say anything. Every time he was about to do so, something would suddenly seem vaguely familiar about the passage, and he would tell himself that they must be going right after all. After this had happened several times, Plucky noticed something that made him sure things were not right. The floor of the cave began to slant gently, but obviously downward. Disturbed and frightened, Plucky jumped quickly to Jeremy's shoulder. I know we never went downhill like this, he said hurriedly, and I thought the way turned more often, but I wasn't sure about that because everything seemed so different with all this light. Jeremy halted the long procession, and Domaris and Minikin came up to see what was wrong. "'What's the matter, Jeremy?' Minikin asked. "'I'm not sure, but Plucky seems to think this isn't the right way.' "'He is the only one who's been here before,' Domaris mentioned. "'But he never suggested that there was more than one way through,' Jeremy said, almost accusingly. "'He said he'd been through many times. "'I didn't think it would be possible to get lost in here.' I have been through here many times, Plucky argued, and I've never gotten lost. As far as I know, there was only one way, but this just doesn't seem right. Poor Plucky sounded confused and dejected. Well, said Jeremy, let's go on a little ways and see what happens. We can always turn back. So they did just that. Continuing on, still sensing that they were going deeper, they suddenly came into a huge cavern. It was so large that... As they entered it, even the torches didn't shed enough light to show them the far wall. Now I know for sure we're lost, wailed Plucky. A wave of disappointment swept over all who heard him. Their disappointment was soon changed into horror, though, for out of the dark shadows a strange new enemy sprang upon them. The Nether Griffin, a cursed race of once proud and beautiful creatures. So long ago had their misfortune come that no one in either kingdom had any recollection of them. They were too many and too swift for the children. Before anyone had a chance to raise a hand against them, the whole army found themselves bound with ropes and lying hopelessly on the floor of the cavern. The nether griffin stood over them, laughing and gloating in shrill, cruel voices. Some of the younger children wept softly. Everyone was afraid. Jeremy struggled bitterly against his ropes. He knew it was useless with hundreds of those things standing over him, but he struggled anyway. His thoughts were dark. Things were bad enough to be sure, but it would have been an even more horrifying experience if the nether griffin had been frightening in their appearance. In truth, they were more comical than frightening. They stood slightly shorter than the youngest of the children. Their bodies were wider than they were tall, fatter for their size than you could imagine. Short stubby arms extended straight out from their little round bodies, and those arms had no elbows. Their heads seemed to connect to their bodies without a neck, but they were nonetheless able to turn them almost completely around,
back to front. Where the head and the body joined, or just slightly below that, they sported a tiny set of shriveled up wings, obviously useless for flying. And though the children were the prisoners, one look into the nether griffin's huge, saggy eyes made the children want to laugh and cry for the distorted little creatures. No matter how pitiful or strange they looked, though, they were a strong foe. They were agile, swift, and cruel in the handling of their captives. Somehow, though, Jeremy began to think that they were not all they seemed. He felt sure that he could reason with them if they would only listen, but would they? One of the nether griffin was the first to speak. His voice was just as comical as his appearance, similar to a recording played at high speed. When he spoke, some of the children could not help giggling. "'You have come into our land uninvited,' he said. "'Now you are our prisoners, our slaves forever.' With that he laughed a long and savage laugh. "'But,' he continued, "'our ancient law states that anyone who intrudes into our land may have, if he chooses, one opportunity of escape.' "'Go on,' said Jeremy. "'It is the chance of a contest,' said the nether griffin. "'Must we each compete individually?' asked Jeremy. "'No, one must compete for you all,' said the same nether griffin. "'Well, then, I will certainly compete,' said Jeremy. "'A spark of hope sprang up inside him, "'even though he didn't know what the contest would be. "'Ah, but we choose the contestant,' said the nether griffin, "'and he smiled a devilish little smile.' It is only the young lady who may compete, he continued, looking over at Don Maurice. Jeremy's hope was extinguished. No, absolutely not, he shouted. You shall not make sport of my sister. I will compete in any contest you choose. But we do not choose you, returned the nether griffin. He was obviously enjoying this. Either she competes, or there will be no contest, and you will all remain here as our slaves. Let me compete, Jeremy, she whispered. It is our only chance to get out of here. Besides, I know Grandmother will help me somehow. But, Dom Reese, you may get hurt. Jeremy's voice was tight with emotion. And if I don't compete, we may all get hurt. Please, Jeremy, let me try. Minikin said to Jeremy, Plainly, they have the upper hand, Captain. At least find out what the contest is before you refuse. There's no danger involved, said the nether griffin, smiling. It is only a race. Pudgy here? will represent the nether griffin. He will give the little lady a head start as he counts to ten. Then he'll make chase. If he catches her before she finds her way out into the sunlight, then you must all stay as slaves. If not, then we will untie you and you will go free. Now, you see, the young lady has every advantage. Look how long her legs are. With this he began to untie Don Maurice. We dwarfs knew of these little rogues, Minikin whispered to Jeremy, it used to be said that they could see in the dark as well as in the daylight. Allow me to prepare a torch for her, and she will be ready to race, Jeremy reluctantly agreed to the Never Griffin's proposal. Oh no, she won't need a torch. This must be a fair race. You see, Pudgy will have no torch. Nor does he need one, Jeremy shouted in angry frustration. Are you ready, my lady? said the Nether Griffin, ignoring his outburst. Jeremy, I've just got to try. The worst that could happen is that they catch me and bring me back. Then she turned to the nether griffin. I'm ready. Then you may begin, he answered. She stood for a moment, not quite understanding, until Pudgy began to count. One, two, three. Then she shot out of the cavern and into the tunnel as fast as she could go. The nether griffin chuckled with delightful anticipation at the thought of the short race in the dark. As Damaris left the cavern and ran through the tunnel, she had no trouble at all seeing the path in front of her. The same light that had directed Plucky and Judd guided her quickly through the tunnel as it shone softly around her. She had no time to wonder about the light. Her thoughts were only on the race. As she ran, she was devising ways of fighting Pudgy off if he caught her, but she wondered if that would be allowed. At first, she thought she could hear Pudgy not far behind, but soon she could hear nothing but her own footsteps, Still, she ran as fast as she could, which wasn't quite as fast as when she started. She was breathing heavily, and her heart was beating loudly in her ears. She didn't trust her ears enough to stop and find out how far behind Pudgy was. She was tired, and her side ached terribly when the color of the light changed in the tunnel. 
She knew at once, though, what she saw ahead. Sunlight. She threw herself on hands and knees and shot through the opening. Outside, she collapsed onto a bed of clover and gasped for air, expecting the nether griffin to run through the opening any moment. For several minutes, she lay there, watching the tunnel exit. But Pudgy never appeared. Excitement about having won the race was mixed with worry about whether or not the nether griffin would keep their word. She wondered what she should do now. A few minutes after the race started, Pudgy waddled sheepishly back into the cavern. When the other nether griffin saw him come in without Dom Maurice, they were at first dumbfounded and then angry. It was obvious to the children that Pudgy was in serious trouble for losing the race. Somehow, Jeremy felt sorry for the odd little creature. The other nether griffin were shouting and railing at him as he backed into a corner. Suddenly, he rolled up into a ball. As he did, the others began kicking him. Their legs were so powerful that Pudgy bounced around the cavern. He bounced off the walls. He bounced off the children. He was so soft that it didn't hurt them. He was so soft that it didn't even seem to hurt him. Even though Pudgy had been part of a plan to make the children slaves, still Jeremy couldn't bear to think what the others might do to him. As the nether griffin kicked Pudgy, Jeremy racked his brain to try to think of a way to stop them. Hey, what about us? Jeremy finally shouted. Come and untie us at once. We won the race. Yes, I suppose you did, grumbled the leader as he walked toward Jeremy. The other nether griffin kicked the unfortunate Pudgy around the room. That's enough for now, the leader called to the others. Untie them. As another griffin untied the children, they jumped to their feet and stretched their legs. Pudgy rolled to a stop and returned to his former shape, shaken but apparently unharmed. The nether griffin, heads hanging in chagrin, disappeared through an opening in the cavern walls. In a few seconds, they were all gone, and the children were left alone. Back out in the fresh air, Dom Maurice decided that all she could do was go back and try to find the others. As she entered the tunnel, she again noticed the soft light. Now she had time to wonder about its source. She walked on, following the light, and under her breath she whispered, Thank you, Grandmother. Back in the cavern, Minikin and Jeremy discussed their choices. What do we do now? Jeremy asked. Nothing we can do except sit and wait, Minikin answered. Then Plucky emerged from the shadows for the first time since the nether griffin had appeared. Do you want me to go and look for Don Maurice? he asked. Jeremy thought for a minute. We might as well let him go and find her, he concluded. It would be easier for one than for all of us to go. I wonder how Don Maurice did it, Jeremy went on. I don't think we'll have any more trouble with the nether griffin, so we'll try and get some rest while you're gone, Plucky. We must hurry, though. The king needs our help. All these delays. We should have been there long before now. Remembering... Jeremy turned to Plucky. Take Grandmother's heart as you go. Jeremy instructed everyone to get some rest and that they would then move on again as soon as Don Maurice rejoined them. Jeremy tried to get some rest too, but his mind was racing with thoughts about the king, the war, Don Maurice, the nether griffin, and their uncertain future. Some of the children giggled and whispered for a while about the nether griffin. How funny Pudgy had looked bouncing around the room. Soon, they began to nod off one by one. None of the children were used to keeping such late hours, and they were much more tired than they had realized. But even after everyone else dozed, Jeremy could not sleep. He rose to his feet and began to pace quietly back and forth. Maybe the race was just a trick to capture Domeries, he thought. No, they had us all captured. They could have taken whoever they wanted. He paced some more. I wonder how she got away. She didn't even have a torch. I'm sure Blackguard didn't help her. I wonder if Grandmother... But he couldn't be sure she was safe until she was back, which she wasn't. What about these nether griffin, he wondered on. He knew nothing of them other than their tradition of giving prisoners a chance to free themselves. He paced some more. There were many doorways out of the cavern, Jeremy was circling the outer edge of it when, for want of something better to do, he started counting doorways. As he passed one doorway, however, he could hear someone talking. 
It sounded like one of the nether griffin. He was arguing with himself. How could I be so stupid? How could I be so slow? And how could I have known she'd be so blinking fast? Well, I went as fast as any of them would have. It wasn't my fault. No, it wasn't. Then the voice paused for a moment, as if listening. Who's there? Jeremy asked. He didn't want to be caught eavesdropping. None of your blinking business, came the reply. Is that you, Pudgy? asked Jeremy. What of it? growled Pudgy. It's me, Jeremy. Come on out, all right? He was silent for a moment, but then Pudgy appeared in the shadow of the doorway. What's the matter, Pudgy? Jeremy had no hard feelings for the little fellow. It's just not fair. It's not my fault she got away. She was just too fast. None of the others would have caught her either. As he spoke, he ventured out into the open a little more. No, I suppose not, said Jeremy, trying to comfort the downhearted nether griffin. But tell me something, he went on. Why do you live underground? Well, it's not because we want to, I can tell you that. Jeremy thought that asking Pudgy about the nether griffin would help him forget about his failure, at least for a while. The boisterous little fellow dove quickly into his story. We didn't always live down here, and we didn't always look like this either. We used to be powerful and beautiful, half lion and half eagle. They called us griffin, and we ruled the forest where we lived, and the air above it too. Where was your forest? asked Jeremy. Was it the one we just came through? No, not that. It's the one that lies between what is now turpitude and altura. To this day, they say, it is uninhabited. It cost that old wizard so many of his goblins, and so much trouble did we give him, that when all was said and done, he didn't even want the blinking forest. No, sir. What old wizard? said Jeremy. Just some wizard of the lower order. Mind you, any blinking wizard is a danger to us mortal creatures, but some are worse than others. He was more powerful than one of his line ought to have been. We still think he had secrets that the rest of the order didn't know about. But he thought he was the best there was, a real arrogant type. Long before he had it in for us, he took some goblins captive. He flattered them and lied to them about what intelligent creatures they were. Eventually, he made them his slaves through his deceit. Then he started telling them they shouldn't have to live below ground. That is where they lived then, still do, somewhere. And that blinking old wizard put into their hearts that we had no right to rule above ground. So these goblins started making trouble for us. They tried trickery, said that we should trade places with them. They actually tried to tell us that it was worth living underground just to miss the foul weather and the winter storms. Ignorant brutes. Anyway, along comes this wizard and starts telling these goblins that they should be ruling over us. He told them that the griffin were actually trespassing on the goblins' ceiling. Can you believe it? We griffin had been there centuries before anyone knew there was such thing as a goblin. In fact, long ago, they came wandering into our wood and were going to live there, but we told them there wasn't room for them and us. Because they didn't have any place else to go, we told them they could stay if they moved underground. Wasn't that kind of us? Now, here came this old wizard... And now the goblins start thinking that they're the ones who let us come into the forest. They said that old wizard had it in his mind to make an army out of those blinking goblins. That's why I say he was a bigger fool than they were. You can't turn a turnip into pork. No, sir. Well, they had no battle plan that we could tell. They just came up all at once. You don't want to hear about what we did to them. There were dead goblins everywhere. We didn't have anyone injured at all, except for one who got his tail lashed off. When he saw that all his little goblins were getting done in, the wizard appeared in a whirlwind. The battle stopped, and the wind died down. There stood a tall, black-robed figure. Boy, it was frightening. And then he shouted, I'll have this land, and you can't stop me. Curse the day. Your former selves no longer be. Waste away. Those were his words. Then, in another whirlwind, he was gone. The few goblins left alive shrieked in horror and took flight. We looked around at each other and got the shock of our lives. We were, well, what you see. Pudgy sighed gravely. For fears that the wizard might return, 
we fled. We found these deserted caves and have lived here in the mountain ever since. It has been many, many generations. I'm sorry, said Jeremy. I don't know, he continued, but do you believe this wizard of yours could still be alive today? I don't know. Wizards do live a long time, and I don't know how old he was then. Why? It's just that I have this funny feeling way down inside me that our enemy, Blackguard, may be your wizard, said Jeremy. Is he deceitful? asked Pudgy. Oh, yes. Is he around here? That I can't say for sure, said Jeremy, but he has been. Well, if he is the same wizard, I surely would like to see you beat him. Don't know how you could, though. We used to be very powerful and blinkin' smart, too, but we couldn't do it. Pudgy! Jeremy shouted loudly enough to startle the little creature. I just had an idea. Why don't you come with us? Oh, why didn't I think of this before? You may be able to help in ways that no one else could. Oh, no, I could never do that, Pudgy said, as a look of pure dread swept across his face. Nether Griffin never go above ground. It's because of the way we look. You understand, don't you? What good is your life down here in this hole? Jeremy said a little hurt. Not much. Can't argue that, said the little nether griffin, much to Jeremy's surprise. Well then, what's stopping you, Pudgy? I'm captain here. I promise that I won't let anyone laugh at you. I know that you must still have a heart of a griffin beating and burning inside of you. You, you would promise that? Pudgy stammered. He stretched his squatty little frame up to its full height. The thought of a noble griffin heart beating inside his breast almost overcame him with emotion. I may just be worth something after all, he said after a moment, though I don't really know what it would be. If you really think I would be of help to you, then I should very much like to come along. We would be honored to have you, Jeremy said as regally as he knew how. Just then, Jeremy looked up and saw Dom Maurice and Plucky stepping into the cavern. He gave a shout, and soon most of the children were roused from their sleep. Dom Maurice, shouted Jeremy again. You're all right. Yes, I'm fine, Jeremy, she said. And I see that you've all been set free. Yes, they kept their word. But Dom Maurice, how in the world did you manage to win the race? I don't know what it was exactly, she said, but somehow I was guided by a light. Plucky says that he has always traveled by that light. I guess the torches were so bright that we couldn't see it. That's why we got lost. I hope we don't make any more mistakes like that, Jeremy said.